this was uh, it was interesting uh, i operated uh, a few years before uh, and my colleague and counter thoracic surgeon very experienced he was always working with blood <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're coming for season three live one-on-one -on -one interviews for the podcast. It's really nice to be able to actually see people in person and speak. And we are in Brussels in Belgium at the European Rhinoplasty course. And I've got the absolute honor and privilege of having one of the other faculty members, all the way from Greece, Janis Konstantinidis, to be able to speak to us. Janis, welcome to the podcast. Nice to meet you, Cameron. It's an honor. And uh, as I told you in, in the coffee break, uh, you do a great job, you know, organizing this uh, World Rhinoplasty Day, the Rhinoplasty Olympics, let's say, and uh, for bringing us together. And uh, I would like to send a message to all our friends, all the family, Rhinoplasty family, that uh, we should uh, meet such a meeting here the European Rhinoplasty course and other meetings to exchange knowledge to Absolutely. share knowledge experience and etc so yes, it's nice to be with you that's no, great uh, tell us for the for the listeners tell us a little bit about, about yourself and how you ended up where you are uh, I started my my uh, specialty in Germany I worked six years with Wolfgang Graf in Fulda and then I moved to home from the frontal sinus frontal sinus surgery. Exactly, exactly. We 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 wrote the first paper together about uh, the classification of the frontal endonasal approaches, and uh, it, I was really uh, this was a great experience for me, and uh, it was a great pleasure to meet such a uh, teacher and uh, let's say second father. Yeah. And then we moved. Uh, I moved uh, to Hamburg University. And then from Hamburg to Erlangen University, worked there with uh, Professor Iro, Professor Wigand. Yeah. You know, and uh, then uh, there was a very difficult decision. Uh, 2003, what to do to stay in uh, in Germany or to move back to the roots, you know, yeah, go yeah. back to, okay. to Greece. And my wife is a German, I have a German wife, and uh, then we decided to go back to, to Greece. And I became then the professor and the head of the university department in Thessaloniki. And since then, uh, we organize uh, meetings, courses, mm -hmm. and uh, I sent my residents in uh, meetings also. And uh, we, the last years, we uh, organized yearly the Thessaloniki Rhino Days. Yeah. We have also organized the ERS meeting in Thessaloniki under difficult conditions, as you know, under COVID. Exactly. The Tell us what's the ERA stand for. The European Rhinologic Society meeting. Yes. And uh, this was a great success and I was very happy we, in the board, in the ERS board. We had a lot of stress. Of course, high well. Yes, exactly. And we had 1,100 1, participants uh, in person. Wow. And nearly 500 uh, online. Wow. And I think this was great. And since then, uh, I think uh, a few rhinologists know where Thessaloniki is. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. It's and uh, this is also something that uh, I would like to send a message. So you are welcome to visit us, you, you Cameron, and yeah. also the other people from this great rhinoplasty yeah. family. Okay, so now let's carry on along this route that we're going on rhinology and rhinoplasty. So I think. It's possibly two things. It's a subject not often spoken about at rhinoplasty courses, but it's something that's much more common than we think is people with some type of nasal pathology, not just purely rhinoplasty. So be that some kind of allergy or some kind of infection, etc. Tell me a little bit about how you approach that with rhinoplasty. That's that's an excellent uh, question, Cameron, because. Uh... We should not uh, lose the the the, the forest yes. and uh, seeing the the tree. You know, we have to evaluate the patient as a whole, as a whole person and as a whole pathology. And uh, very often, we see patients that had an excellent uh, septal septoplasty, excellent aesthetic result after mm -hmm. a septorhinoplasty, but they still have a blocked nose mm -hmm. due to the allergic rhinitis, vasomotoric rhinitis 
chronic rhinosinusitis. So what I, we are doing is we completely evaluate our patients also about other pathologies. And it is very important and I think we should uh, do that to treat them, to, to go for all therapeutic possibilities before we operate, before we, we take the knife and perform a septal rhinoplasty. And uh, I think this is very, very important uh, because in the end, if the patient cannot breathe, I think he, this is a problem. And uh, yeah. he asked you, uh, you did uh, uh, excellent uh, work, but I cannot breathe. Yeah. I still have problems. Yeah. So this is very important. And we are also uh, take care about uh, the condition of the mucosa before we operate. I think yes. this is also another issue. So to use saline solutions, to use pharmaca uh, and uh, sprays and etc. cetera, mm -hmm. uh, to have uh, your nasal mucosa in the best condition before yes. and during surgery. Okay. So another question. So a patient that presents and they have nasal polyps mm -hmm. as well. So there's maybe some septal pathology, mm -hmm. nasal polyps, they want their rhinoplasty. There's no signs of any infection though. Mm -hmm. What do you do in such a case? Do you do functional endoscopic sinus surgery at the same time or do you do two different operations? We know, we know from the literature that there is a, if a patient has no uh, a purulent uh, rhinosinusitis mm -hmm. inside, the, uh, pass inside the nose and also no uh, aspect biloma, et cetera. In these cases, there is a very uh, low risk to have an infection mm -hmm. if you do both. That okay. means if you do a uh, FES operation, a functional endoscopic sign surgery yeah. and a rhinoplast. So we do both. Okay. Only in cases where you see pus inside the nose or we see yeah. in the CT an aspergillosis yeah. and we have uh, an isolated pathology, uh, a purulent pathology, okay. you know, in the frontal sinus, for example, yeah that, no, that uh, is not easily accessible or that, that after surgery you may have problems okay. after functional endoscopic surgery, then in these cases we do first the FES and then we go in a second step and do the rhinoplasty. But in the majority of the cases, we do both in one. Okay. Because it's, it's also uh, easier for our patients, you know, in Greece, to say the patient you have a problem with polyps and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and to do two operations uh, to pay yeah. twice, uh, this is this is a little bit difficult. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't want to chat about is packing the nose after surgery. So if it's like just a pure septorhinoplasty compared to a septorhinoplasty with sinus work at the same time, is there differences for you in that? And if so, what do you do? Uh, we are we are still packing the nose. We are still yeah. packing the nose. What? Uh, we we use we use Marocell, okay, and we use gel foam. Yes, you know, uh, yeah. and we put it on the traumatic surfaces. Yes, and uh, this will resorb. Yes, uh, the the first phase, and then we use the suction to remove it. And uh, we use also silicone foams. Yeah, to stabilize uh, uh, the the septum. And the last years I didn't uh, saw a hematoma. Yes, synechia. Yes and etc. And we start directly after removal of the packing with washing the nose. Yeah. And we see the first week every two, three days our patients, yeah. the first week, then after one week, and then after 10 days, and then every month. Okay. You know, wound healing uh, is completely after three months. In the first three, four weeks, you have the crusting. Yes. Then you have a lymphedema. Mm -hmm. Then you, you have a granula, granulations. And then you have uh, uh, the, the closure of the wound. Yes. And this is a process of nearly three months. There is a study from Oseman. Yeah. He was also in Erlangen University. And uh, the most important for us are the first three, four weeks. Yes. And uh, especially before summer, we send the people after two, three weeks to the seaside to wash yes. with, clean, with clean water from yeah. the sea. And I, I can tell you, this is something really helpful. And post-op antibiotics? Post-op, uh, no. If there is no uh, pus, if there is no, if there is no purulent uh, uh, rhinosinusitis, we do not use antibiotics okay. post-operatively. Okay. Well, only, only a single shot intraoperatively. Yes. Okay. Couple more things I want to know. 
the, the wave of preservation rhinoplasty has potentially made the, for the new person wanting to do rhinoplasty seem overwhelming because there's so many techniques on it. What would you say to residents listening on the podcast who kind of at the start of their career, some of your fatherly advice? I, I, I think we should not start with preservation technique. We should start with the normal techniques as we started. Mm -hmm. And then to understand first the anatomy, you know, to perform a conservative hamlectomy, to separate the upper lateral cartilages from the septum, go incrementally, remove a little bit the, the cartilaginous part of the hump, uh, the septal uh, of the septum, and then go and incrementally remove uh, the cartilage and then remove also the bony hump. And then learn all the other techniques, the spider grafts, the auto spider flaps, and all these techniques. And then you have the knowledge, you have the knowledge to do also preservation technique because it sounds yes. very easy. It is not easy. Yeah. You have to, to be careful, you know, how much you resect. <coughs> Sorry. How much you will resect, where you will resect, and then how you perform the lateral osteotomies. Yeah. How you perform the osteotomies and also if you do push down in which cases, yeah. And which are the ideal candidates? Yeah. I think yeah. this is the yeah. most important. You cannot do a preservation technique in all the cases. Yes. It's impossible. Absolutely. If you have, if you have a difficult uh, radix, you know, you cannot do a preservation. Yeah. So I think this is an excellent technique for special cases. But if I have to give an advice, I think this is not a technique to start. Yes. Start yes. with the septum, learn the septum. As the septum it goes, so goes the nose, you know, yeah. it's so important for, for support of the tip, for, for the, for the axis, you know, uh, to learn, uh, to, to manage uh, difficulties in the septoplasty. And then after the septum, the, uh, the evolution must come step by step. Yes. You cannot go. And then the, if you do rhinoplasties, Cameron, I think you have to select also the cases yeah. in the beginning, easy cases. Yeah. If you have the feeling that you are not confident, then have another more experienced surgeon with you in the first operations and then go and go. And there are three basic, uh, uh, let's say factors. One is to the theoretical knowledge. You have to learn, you have to visit meetings. The other is uh, to go to the lab, to dissect, to get in dissection courses. And the third is uh, to to have also a, a teacher to have a good relationship with other teachers to discuss your problems to can to have the opportunity to can call him and ask him you have such a case what you see so mm -hmm. and uh, it's I think a rhinoplasty to teach it it's very very difficult yeah it's not easy yeah and everything you do it's visible you know it's 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 not easy I think uh, and it it is a long educational yeah. process yeah. and progress. So I love this, this, this Greek philosopher, the stuff you say, it's wonderful. I'm glad you didn't stay in Germany. Eh? I'm glad you came back to Greece. I want to hear that funny story again. You told me about the cardiothoracic surgeon. Ah. Tell our listeners about <laughs> yes. that. This was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I operated uh, a few years before uh, and my colleague and cardiothoracic surgeon, very experienced. He is always working with blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yes. So open the thorax and yeah, it's yeah. up inside and etc. And uh, uh, his wife needed an, uh, an uh, rhinoplasty. So yeah. I did the rhinoplasty and he asked me to be present in the OR. Yeah. I said, it's, you know, the basic principles are against that. Yes. Because there are principles that say, don't be in the OR, don't operate people that you like and don't be in the OR people that you have a strong emotional relationship. Yes. And he said, no, I will be there because she meet me and uh, then, and then I said, you have to ask the director of the private uh, uh, hospital. And he gives him, uh, he said also, okay, you can go. And then he came inside. I started with my rhinoplasty and then he collapsed. <laughs> and I found it very, very uh, funny. Because, because such an experienced surgeon, you yeah. know, 
And this is, I think, this demonstrates how important it is to follow the principles. Yeah. You know, yeah. not to be inside, not to operate in uh, people that you love and uh, not operate your your family. Yeah. No, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting listening to you. And I think one of the big take home messages for today is how important the nasal physiology is. And, you know, you can't go out there and think you're going to smack out a rhinoplasty if you're not actually managing the patient holistically, you know? And um, it's absolutely right. I made the experience, uh, Cameron, that uh, if you have a patient that the functional result is excellent and there is the aesthetic result is not perfect, you have not a problem. You have to go with him and go for a second small procedure. But if you have a patient, if the aesthetic result is not, and he cannot breathe, then you have a big problem, a huge problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because this is something that it's on, it's not only the mirror, you know, it's, it's, it's on, not only the aesthetic yeah. result, he cannot breathe. No, absolutely. I had such a case, uh, I revised it a few months before, uh, she worked as a personal trainer. She couldn't work more. That's terrible. It's terrible, yes, yeah. of course. Sure. So I think we have to think about the function, especially as ENT doctors, yeah. Yeah. and try our best to improve also the aesthetic appearance of the nose. Uh, but I think uh, the main is uh, the function. The main is, as you said, uh, the septum, the other pathologies of the nose. Because if we don't think about that, this is unacceptable as an ENT doctor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, guys, there you've heard it from the horse's mouth, eh? Yes, absolutely. Yes? Thank you. Thank you so much for this It chance. is a pleasure. And stay the way you are. Continue with the Rhinoplasty Olympics. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, you do an excellent uh, job uh, because uh, uh, Rhinoplasty and our field needs also people that bring us together yeah. to exchange knowledge and to share experience, you know. And uh, thank you very much yeah, cool. for giving me the opportunity to speak to all our Great. People. So, guys, come back again next week for another episode. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.